criminal law. And now we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to get into the civil litigation side of things again. We set the table for this earlier in the semester when we talked about the courts and trial procedure and all of those things. Okay, so a lot of civil litigation at the state level is going to be tort cases. And a lot of what businesses are involved in as far as litigation is going to be tort cases. There are kind of two really main areas where businesses are possibly going to have to go to court. One is a breach of contract, which we're going to cover in a subsequent module, and another is tort. So if you have any kind of business that uh, welcomes in the public, uh, you have some opportunities, I guess, to get involved with torts. And even if you don't deal directly with the public, we're going to talk about some business torts that uh, happen between businesses or businesses and their people. All right. There's a lot of great clip art available for torts now. I'm really excited about it, as you can see. The slip and fall is kind of the stereotypical tort that we think about, but I'm going to show you there's a whole world beyond that. All right. So the word tort comes from torture. All right. It's got the same roots. So thinking about torture, a lot of times we... <laughs> You would think about an injury, right? Okay, so some of these torts are going to have to do with physical harm. Physical harm done by one person to another or by a business to a person, okay? Um, there's a whole universe of, of these kind of physical harm torts. And then there's also going to be ones that are primarily going to cause financial harm. We say a tort is a civil wrong. What does that mean? Well, it's a really expansive definition, right? I mean, essentially the tort is when you do or in some cases don't do something that causes damage to somebody else and, you, and you're liable for it, all right? So it's different than a crime because we're talking about interactions between private parties in general, all right? There are times when you could sue the government for a tort kind of touch on that, but more or less, you're thinking about cases between private parties, right? In Iowa, nuisance tort cases are kind of familiar if you live near a large animal feeding operation. There are lawsuits that are often in the news about the smell. There were some examples of that in the test that I gave you guys. Um, Lots of different examples. But we, we think about a situation where somebody's behavior has unjustly caused someone else to suffer loss or harm. And it's different from criminal law, because in criminal law, we really talk about um, someone is injuring society in general. In torts, we're looking at somebody is injuring somebody else specifically. And this is our way, our dispute resolution system for you to hopefully get some damages back some reimbursement from that other person. Now these are different than contract. We're going to have a whole section on contract, but uh, with contracts you're explicitly setting out your rights and duties to another person or another business, and that can be in writing or Sometimes it can be orally. We'll talk about those things in the appropriate chapter. But the idea is in contract, you kind of walk into a situation and there's no duties pre-existing, but you agree to create some going both ways. Uh, torts are a little bit different. They just sort of exist around us. There are some general rules of conduct that you don't violate. You walk down the street, you don't punch somebody. You own a house. You shovel the sidewalk so people don't slip. You own a swimming pool, you put a fence around it so people don't run in there and drown. Okay? Now, is there a rule book or a set of statutes that tell you these things? No. These are just, in, in our common law, these are just things you don't do without potential penalty. Okay? So thoughts about contract where you're explicitly creating duties 
for somebody else. We'll just set those aside for now. If you go to court to sue somebody or some company uh, because they have committed a tort against you, remember you're on the civil side. So it's preponderance of the evidence, 51%. Does that make it easy to win a tort case? I wouldn't say that, okay? Because as the plaintiff, the burden is on you to prove all the elements of the tort. And I'm going to show you some of these torts have very specific requirements, okay? So it's still on you, but it's not the same as a criminal case where the prosecutor has to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, all right? Um, in tort, as we say in any kind of civil litigation, uh, a losing defendant is held liable. They are not guilty. You can't be guilty of a tort. Tort, civil law thing, guilt is a criminal law thing. They don't mix, okay? They don't mix. If you can remember these four words you're going to be able to decipher or decode any tort situation that you see on the exam or hopefully in life, all right? Duty, breach, causation, and damages. Figure out some kind of mnemonic or acronym that you can use to remember these four things because you have to have these for, uh, for an actionable tort situation. In other words, if you want to successfully sue somebody for the tort that they did to you, you have to have all four of these in every single situation. And if you don't, what do you have? Well, you've got an incomplete case, one that you're not going to win. Duty. So our law has some specific duties that are written out. We have some torts that actually are written in the statutory code. One of them that comes to mind is... Uh, theft of trade secrets, all right? Our legislature can create a tort cause of action if they want to by writing a law. So we've got a law about theft of trade secrets, and I don't know it verbatim, but essentially it says if you steal things like customer lists, computer code, things like that, uh, you can be held liable for the actual damages times three, if I remember that correctly. I haven't looked at it in a while, so don't quote me on that, but that was my recollection the last time I looked it up. Okay, so that's kind of an express duty. But then you've got all these implied duties that are kind of just like the unwritten rules of society. So I don't know if Abraham Lincoln actually said this or not. I think this quote's a little bit too general, and honestly, half the quotes on the Internet are attributed to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but the quote is one that I like. Your rights end where my nose begins. All right, so you can essentially... He's saying, you can do whatever you want, but if you touch me, it's going down, right? Old Abe, bare knuckle, no. He was, he was a lawyer, not a fighter, all right? Um, sorry, I just looked a little tired. I was just going to liven up that mental image. Um, if you start, you know, doing unwanted touching, we're going to find out that's the tort of battery, okay? So the duty of care encompasses all of these kind of unwritten rules of, of polite society, okay? People are free to act as they please as long as their actions don't infringe on the interests of others. And I would maybe throw one more word in there and say do not unlawfully infringe or unjustly infringe on the interests of others, okay? So what does breach look like? Well, it can look like this. That's an awesome clip art. I forgot I had that one. Um, you breach the duty of care by failing to behave the way a reasonable person would under similar circumstances. In other words, you act out. All right? Now, who gets to define reasonable person? Who gets to define similar circumstances? Well, those are issues of proof for the court. And that's where they're going to look at common law, a.k.a. case law, in the past. All right? You have a business with some sidewalk frontage and somebody slips and falls on some ice that you didn't s put salt on or break up and shovel and they sue you for negligence, the court's going to look back at the case as well. Have we ever allowed anybody to recover damages for uh, slip and fall on ice? 
Okay, yeah, well, here's a line of cases where we did. Okay, yeah, we're, we're going to allow that claim. Causation, this is where things get a little bit trickier, okay? The word is simple. Essentially, did the, did the defendant cause the damages? And you're saying, well, why would you sue somebody that didn't cause the damages? It's not always clear. You can have multiple actors. You can have a long chain of events. You can have situations where you're not really sure which party did exactly what. Like maybe you buy a product that is made up of parts from five different suppliers and the product injures you and you don't know if it was the company that made the wheels or the company that made the axle or the ball bearings or whatever. So these are fighting terms and the judge and the jury get to look at these and try to figure these out. All right. There's some, uh, some boundary conditions around this, some limits and some guidelines, okay? So we do look at causation in fact, or sometimes you might hear it called but for causation. So did the defendant's breach ultimately lead to the injury? In other words, but for what they did, this wouldn't happen, kind of like a root cause kind of thing, all right? So that's one kind of causation. Uh, but then we're going to impose another requirement on it, which is that the harm is foreseeable. All right. And we're going to spend a little time with a case called the Paul's Graph case that started to set out this idea of it can't be too distal from um, initial movement of the defendant to the harm. So if you look at this animated uh, clip art I've got here, this is one of these I don't know, I think it's called a Rube Goldberg machine where you have something and it takes a million steps in between and then it gets an output, input, quite a few steps, output. So I, I kind of think about that when I'm thinking about foreseeability, all right? Were there a million steps in between? Are these, is the input and the output, you know, the action and the damage closely related or is it very attenuated, right? Very distal, all right? And you need both of these kinds of causation, and you need to prove them as a plaintiff to win your case. You got to have damages, all right? So this goes back to our idea of standing. If you are not injured, whether it's physically, mentally, financially, business-wise, whatever, if you're not actually injured, if you're not the one who is hurt by the conduct, you don't get to sue over it, all right? Uh, so it's not just threatened damages or possible damages. So um, if a person who lives in the apartment next to you says, I'm going to punch you in the face on Thursday, is that criminal? Well, that may be, but remember we're only looking at the civil side. Do you have a cause of action for tort, for battery? They haven't actually done it yet. All right, so you got to have actual damages. And they have to be quantifiable. In other words, you have to have a way to show the judge and or the jury why they should give you money because of your damages, and you have to prove them, okay? You gotta prove your damages. So I think the commonly held wrong thought is like, oh, I slipped and fell, um, it's worth a million dollars, right? Well, first of all, those cases are few and far between, uh, but second, when, when you go to show damages to a jury, you gotta have stuff like medical bills. Um, you gotta have an expert testifying to uh, how much pain and suffering you're in. You gotta have an expert to testify uh, how, many, how much you're gonna lose in future wages. You know, in other words, this person was working uh, full time at a job making this, now they can only work half time at a job making this, and they probably had 25 years left to work. So we're gonna multiply that through and have this number is the amount they would have earned had they not been injured. Okay, so I think a lot of people uh, wrongly believe, because the media tells them so, that 
getting injured is like uh, pulling the handle on a slot machine and winning a big jackpot every time. It's, it's really not. It's really not. So a good example is negligence. All right. This uh, is a broad kind of catch-all uh, term and, and also a category of tort. All right. Negligence can encompass a whole lot of different things from professional negligence all the way down to the slip and fall. All right. Slip and fall is probably the easiest one to think about. So suppose um, this lady here looks like she's wearing a bathrobe, looks like maybe she was by a swimming pool at a, a gym or a hotel or something like that. All right, caution, wet floor sign, she slipped, she looks like she hurt her knee, okay? So what's the legal duty of care owed by that business to the people who are in there? Well, in general, you've got to, uh, if you're going to have walking surfaces, those have to be you know, reasonably safe to walk on. Um, that sign is going to present kind of a hidden fifth element we can talk about as well. But in general, if you're going to have a business and people are going to be there, whether they're your employees or, or uh, people coming in to buy things, it's got to be safe, all right? You have a duty not to create an unreasonable risk of harm to others. Did they breach the duty? Okay, so we've established there was a duty, as you have in any situation where you have a business. Uh, did they breach a duty? And what's the standard there? All right, so we look at kind of a reasonable person standard. Doesn't mean uh, every inch of the floor has to be perfectly neat and clean, but is there a safe place to walk? Is there actual injury? Okay, so she's going to have to come in with medical records, doctor's testimony, medical bills, right? And did the breach of duty cause the injury? So it's going to have to show that she didn't hurt that knee playing tennis the day before or running a marathon the day after, but that it was right then and there. Now that sign, that caution wet floor, we don't, I don't think we mention it uh, a whole lot in the book, but there's kind of a hidden fifth element here, and that's defenses, affirmative defenses, right? So they've warned her. That's going to come into play. We'll talk about some of the defenses to tort actions, but that's going to come into play. And then there's another hidden element as well, and that's ability to pay damages. Okay? So the whole point behind filing a lawsuit is not that it's fun, because I, I think as we've shown and established, it's not fun. It's not fun. It takes a lot of time, and it will cost you a lot of money to bring this, lawsuit, all these things I've been saying about uh, x-rays and doctor's testimony, that stuff doesn't come for free. You have to pay for all that, right? Um, so is it even worth suing uh, someone or something o over a tort? Well, in this case, you know, it looks like, like I said, a hotel or a gym. Most places are going to have insurance. As a matter of fact, a lot of places are going to be required to carry insurance just for this reason. Right? So you have to kind of figure out, is it worth it? So let's talk about categories of common torts first. And I want to sort of rank these by intentionality. And I think you'll see uh, why this works as we go through them. But I want to talk about these common categories first. And then after we talk about the degrees of intentionality and how we kind of think about these things and some examples, then we're going to get into like specific uh, tort causes of action. I don't want to start with the specifics because there's like this whole universe of torts and I could just give you different ones, but that's not going to help you. So let's talk about it in the large picture first. So in terms of intentionality, we got negligence at the bottom going up to recklessness and then intentional torts at the very top of that, that chart. Strict liability is a little weird, okay? We're, we'll talk about that last, but I'll show you how it fits. So negligence is, is going to be the, I would say, the vast majority of tort cases that actually reach court, okay? And some of these are slip and fall. Uh, a lot of them would be auto collisions. 
um, workplace accidents, somebody gets hurt on the job, um, malpractice falls into here. So like medical malpractice or legal malpractice, that's a kind of negligence. And kind of the key thing to think about here is that the person or the company that injured you, they didn't mean to do it necessarily, all right? But there was a duty and they failed to meet that. So if your doctor is doing an operation, maybe he's fixing a hernia repair and he kind of forgets and leaves a surgical sponge in you and sews you back up and then it causes some problems later you have to have another operation for that to come out, right? Did the doctor do that because he was mean and he hated you? No, it was essentially an accident, right? But did it cause damages? Yeah. So why should you have to bear the cost and all the pain of that when somebody else, you know, essentially screwed up? That's the idea behind negligence. The, the business who had an icy steps in front, did they want to trip you and crack your skull? No, they wanted you to come in and buy products. But that happened, and you got hurt, and you had to go to the emergency room, and you had all these bills. Why should you have to foot that? Right? So that's the idea. And these carry only compensatory damages, and for the, uh, the vast majority of these are covered by some kind of insurance. All right? When you're in business, you buy insurance to cover this stuff. If you have a nonprofit, you buy insurance to cover this stuff, okay? Because it's, it's a rare occurrence, but medical bills are expensive, and it, it can cost a lot of money to cover these things, so you buy insurance. An example, suppose you got two friends, Sparty and Herky, close friends, right? Uh, Herky has a sleepover party. Sparty comes over and he's a little hungry and Herky says, I've got a burrito for you. I cooked this just for you. Suppose it's a little bit questionable. Sparty gets sick and has to go to the hospital. Well, that's negligence. It's the kind of thing that's covered by your homeowner's insurance policy. All right? Herky didn't mean to make Sparty sick, at least in this example. Just happened. Now, recklessness is in this middle category, all right? It's between negligence and an intentional tort. I don't know if there's any, like, classic Saturday Night Live fans in the audience, but you can go on YouTube and watch this video. This, this is Dan Aykroyd, the actor, and he's playing a character called Irving Mainway. And Irving Mainway is a toy manufacturer, and he's a real jerk. All right, he makes really unsafe toys. And one of them is this, it's called Johnny Bag of Glass. It's a big bag of broken glass. And he's saying how kids can play with it, be creative, right, with the bag of broken glass. Hmm, I think it's uh, pretty clear if you play with broken glass, you're gonna get injured, right? Now he's not going out and like physically cutting the kids with the glass himself, but this isn't really negligence either, right? I mean, this is a pretty dumb thing to do, okay? So that's kind of what I think about when I think about recklessness. It's somewhere in between, I want to hurt you and I'm going to make it happen, and I didn't mean for that to happen. It's somewhere in between, okay? Now, why is that important? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, it can carry enhanced damages. Okay, so not only compensatory damages for the injury you suffer, but a jury can throw on some punitive damages to punish the person for being so reckless and stupid. Actually, for being so reckless. The stupid part is kind of neither here nor there. All right? So they can say Irving Mainway, Incorporated. Uh, we can't believe you sold a bag of glass to children. All right, we're going to give $1,000 for the... Uh, hospital bills, and we're going to give another 10,000 in punitive damages, right? Sometimes your insurance doesn't cover you for recklessness. So you have to uh, look carefully at your policy, all right? If you have the kind of business uh, where 
things get uh, left out, unsafe conditions get created sometimes, uh, not necessarily intentionally, but because people aren't paying attention. I'm thinking of like maybe ski slopes, uh, you know, those trampoline businesses. Uh, you know, I, I can think of situations, maybe carnivals, although good luck suing a carnival, um, situations where things might just be pretty far out of whack. And some insurance may not cover that. Also, if you're hurt on the job, we have this system in Iowa called workers' comp. Each state has some uh, variety of it, but workers' comp is kind of a, uh, an insurance um, situation where if you're hurt on the job and it's only due to your employer's negligence, then you go into that system and essentially you only get your medical bills. You don't get pain and suffering or anything else. You might get some lost wages. But if it's recklessness, you might be able to actually sue your employer and get some damages over and above. Um, so this is kind of the middle category. I can't say 13 years of practicing law that I've ever sued someone for recklessness, I don't think. Uh, it's usually one or the other. So example from our two friends, suppose the burrito that Herky serves Sparty had been left out on the counter at room temperature for seven days. He's still not intentionally poisoning him, but this is a little bit more than mere negligence, right? Intentional torts. So this is full on, I'm trying to hurt you. Wiley Coyote is a patron saint of intentional torts. Now, I know you guys are a little young for like Saturday morning cartoons, but I was kind of raised, I was at the tail end of this uh, Saturday morning cartoon tradition of Wiley Coyote. If you haven't seen it, there's this bird he really hates called the Roadrunner, and he'll go to any lengths to try and kill him. And he never does. Spoiler alert, uh, 50 years later or whatever, he's still chasing the roadrunner. But, you know, he tries to blow him up with dynamite and push him off cliffs and, you know, get him with a rocket and all this. So I always think of Wile E. Coyote kind of stuff when I think of intentional torts. They're not all that exciting, but they can be. So intentional tort cases I brought, uh, I told you about the world's worst neighbor case where the fellow was walking around with a rifle. Um, in my client's yard or right on the periphery saying, I'm going to shoot your horses. That's, I'm going to shoot you if you come out. You know, when, when my client was on her horse uh, and he was in his truck, he tried forcing her off the road, did force her off the road. All right? Those are intentional torts. I want to hurt you. I'm coming after you to do it. And, and I did it. Or at least made the attempt. Okay? Now, my defendant in there, let's call him Robert, that's his name, um, he didn't probably know, well, he probably didn't know a lot because he was using a lot of meth, um, but, you know, he knew anger, meth-fueled anger. Uh, he didn't know, well, I'm about to commit assault, then battery, and false imprisonment, you know, and he didn't know that, but he had the intent to do something bad, all right, something that is tortious conduct. And that's the standard that we look at. Did the person intend to commit an act that the consequences of that act interfere with the personal or business interests of another in a way that's not permitted by law? So torts are a general intent kind of deal. These, okay, it, you don't have to know the torts that you're committing in order to be sued for them, but you do have to make intentional steps toward uh, harming that person, either physically or financially, okay? So an intentional tort between our two friends. Suppose Herky laced that burrito he was going to give his friend Sparty with a strong laxative. You see my great Photoshop job there? Sparty's missing part of his leg. Well, all right, I'm not a Photoshop wizard. So... Intentional torts, uh, what's, what's another big deal about those? Well, so you've got the damages issue. There's actually two kind of big deals about these. So one is the damages issue. So not only compensatory damages, but you can ask for punitive damages as well. So the world's worst neighbor case, 
Uh, one of my clients had to uh, take uh, anxiety medicine, and she had to get counseling because this guy was basically, literally was terrorizing the entire neighborhood and her, uh, her the most, okay? So I went in, and we had these medical bills, and I said, you know, we, we want him to pay the medical bills for the damage he's caused, and we want punitive damages as well, okay? So we won that case, no big surprise. Um, the guy was just about the most tortious actor I've ever met, uh, and, and we got our compensatory damages, and then the judge also awarded us twice that amount for punitive damages, okay? To punish that person, to say, you don't do this kind of thing in society, all right? So that's one important thing about intentional torts. Like recklessness, you can get additional levels of damages. The other thing has to do with the kind of judgment that you get. All right, so we talked about this a little bit in the kind of module two and three about, quote, getting a judgment against somebody. So if you win civil suit and the other person is held liable, you get uh, a judgment recorded on the records of the courts. Essentially, it's an enforceable debt that they now owe you. Now, that doesn't mean the money just flows in. You still have to go get it, right, either by garnishing their bank account, garnishing their wages, or, or various collection methods. But a judgment for intentional torts is non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. And that's a really big deal, okay? Because if, I, if you're in an auto accident, and say you don't have auto insurance, and you, you kill a family, right? And so you get a $5 million judgment against you for negligence, okay? Are you going to be working the rest of your life to pay that off? Well, that would be probably the ethical thing to do. But what you could do is you could declare bankruptcy, and that would just go away, all right? Um, and their estate would be deprived of any way to collect that judgment against you. Um, an intentional tort does not allow you to discharge it in bankruptcy. Does it matter for the kind of guy who terrorizes a neighborhood with a rifle, who's you know defecating in the lane in front of my client's house? Now, this guy's not a sophisticated financial actor, okay? You know, as far as whether we're going to collect or not, sort of up in the air. But when you get to financial fraud cases and you got guys like Bernie Madoff or you know other rich uh, Wall Street type folks, that's a really big deal. Because those folks have gone through bankruptcy, mo many of them, several times uh, in their life already because it's advantageous. And they're more than happy to scrape off your judgment by going in again. But if you can get an intentional tort judgment, that's going to follow them. That sticks. All right. So when I would do my fraud cases, we would plead them as intentional torts uh, and go for that because that's going to follow them. You get a judgment, it's good for 10 years. You can renew it for another 10 years in Iowa, all right? So they can't scrape it off or leave it behind. So that is actually a really big deal. Now let's look at some specific types of torts. And I'm going to talk about non-business torts and business torts. We don't call them white-collar torts or blue-collar torts, like we sort of uh, hinted around with crimes, we just you know, business or non-business. I think that's a better way to split it anyways. So here's a couple good ones, some folks fighting in an alley. Those are non-business torts. Assault and battery are actually two different concepts under tort. Y you're probably familiar with those terms from perhaps hearing them in the context of criminal law, all right? And in there, they can mean the same thing. They can mean different things. It really depends on the state. Uh, but the tort definitions are relatively widely accepted across all of the states, and they're different. So assault is kind of the first part. It's putting somebody in fear of uh, imminent harmful contact. All right, so this little cartoon here, the lady who's got the sword hanging over the guy's head. And she's saying in German, will you go with me? So it's a weird way to ask somebody on a date. And you can see he's unhappy, all right? He's in some pretty imminent fear of harmful contact. He says the wrong thing. She drops the sword, all right? So tort of assault, 
examples here, you pull a gun on somebody and hold it, you know, uh, hold it pointed at them. Uh, you tell somebody that you're going to beat them up and maybe accompanied by a step towards them or pulling back your fist or something like that. Those things are actionable if you've got all of the elements. And of course, the hard one with a mere assault that does not culminate in, in an actual harmful touching is you got to show damages for that, right? Um, the world's worst neighbor case, you know, we all, we pled this as one of the things. And, you know, we, we did show some damages. The guy, you know, forced my client off the road on her horse. She didn't fall off, but, you know, she was scared by that. That was one of the things that led to, you know, and this happened more than once led to her becoming very anxious. Um, guy walking around pointing a rifle at you constantly, which was going on, you know, that's going to lead to a lot of mental stress, mental injury kind of things. All right. So you do sometimes see an assault case without a battery, but unfortunately, most people follow through, and then they commit a second tort. Battery, harmful touching, or uh, unwanted touching, or offensive touching, all right? So this can encompass a lot of different things, from being someone shooting you, to punching you, to uh, this kind of unwanted workplace touching of a sexual nature, right? All of these different things uh, can lead to a, a case for battery. Um, again, you got to show duty, breach, causation, damages, okay? And the damages are generally going to be, I guess, the, maybe the hardest part of that to show unless you actually have medical bills and things like that, all right? Some defenses to this. Oh, I don't know why I've got animations there. Sorry about that. Uh, maybe you would like to assault and batter your friends, on the gridiron, or on the ice, or in the ring, okay? Boxing, wrestling, hockey, these are essentially a festival of assault and battery, if you will. More battery than assault, but there's some good old-fashioned intimidation that happens too, all right? So courts have held that you can consent to a certain level of this in accordance with the rules of the game and that you're willfully participating in it, okay? You're playing football, and you're playing tackle football, and you get tackled, you don't get to sue somebody for that, right? That's just part of the game. Boxing, you get punched in the face, that's what you're there for, all right? Now, sometimes people take it too far. A uh, situation a few years ago up in Canada, in the NHL, if you ever watch hockey, you know that it's not uncommon for the players to get in fist fights. What is uncommon is when somebody will hit somebody else with a stick. That's taken it a little too far. And that happened, a guy hit another guy in the face and head with a stick, and he hurt him really bad. Knocked him out, uh, had you know a lot of medical bills, had a lot of uh, problems, medical problems after that. And that was, I believe, prosecuted as a crime uh, but certainly the person who is injured could sue the guy who did that to him because you don't consent to that, okay? It's, it's looking at the rules of the game. Self-defense can be an affirmative defense if you're sued for assault and battery. Now, we talked about that as a defense to the criminal side, but remember, the burden of proof is lower here, okay? So if you're going to use this... Uh, you know, as an affirmative defense, remember you're admitting the conduct and you're saying, but I had a, a legal justification, all right? So he shouldn't get to recover his medical bills because he started it and I was just defending myself. And defense of others or property. Again, this is kind of going to be subject to a reasonableness test. It's not going to be a situation where it's like, oh, that guy called me a name, so I shot him. No, not going to work that way. All right, so these are all kind of subject to a reasonableness assessment. False imprisonment. Now, this sounds weird, kind of old-timey, right? Who goes around putting other people in prison? 
not common in that sense, but the line of cases that you read about the, this tort in law school really has to do a lot with shoplifting cases. So stores have a kind of a, I guess it's a common law or sometimes it's a statutory right to detain somebody that they think is shoplifting for a short amount of time until the police can come, all right? And they have to let you, like, use the bathroom and things like that. So there are these cases where, like, a mom and her kids would be detained by a store uh, because they think the mom is shoplifting, so they lock them in a closet for eight hours and don't let them go to the bathroom. It's really stupid, right? Well, it's also tortious, all right? That's a false imprisonment kind of tort. Uh, world's Worst Neighbor case, we brought uh, false imprisonment claims because Robert would stand outside my client's house with a rifle and say, if you come outside, I'm going to shoot you. And he had a rifle, and he's standing there. All right? False imprisonment. can't remember if we, I, th I think we won that count, actually. Um, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of one way to do it. IIED is the initials for this one. And, and IIED is in some ways kind of a catch-all for just really, really awful conduct that doesn't necessarily fit into assault, battery, or false imprisonment. But you're doing things to somebody that is mentally damaging them. All right? Something terrible. Um, it's got to be extreme and outrageous conduct that causes serious emotional harm. And to win these cases, you've generally got to show um, psychiatric harm, have doctors testify, uh, that person has suffered damages, maybe they got medical bills. Um, in situations where this happens, uh, sometimes you would see something like, you know, um, somebody, somebody essentially does something really, really awful to another person, and it, it doesn't necessarily fit uh, in one of those earlier categories. One of the, I don't know, bigger cases of this in recent years was there was uh, a person or a company uh, who was exploiting uh, people who were homeless, and they were giving them alcohol and encouraging them to fight, and then they were filming it, and then marketing this as bum fights. It's really low class. Uh, kind of thing. And they made a couple million dollars off of this. And these guys are getting hurt and they don't have health insurance or any way to get healed up, right? And somebody heard about it and these uh, folks who were homeless got some legal representation and they sued the company. Essentially saying, you got us drunk, encouraged us to fight, now we're injured, you know, you made a bunch of money off of us, we saw none of that. Uh, and the company was ordered to pay all that money back to the people they hurt, okay? So that's IIED. Uh, when you look at a case like this, you got to, my, my torts teacher, who is a nice lady, she, she would say, if it's going to be IID, you got to say, that's outrageous. She had kind of a, woo, kind of, a, she kind of laughed like a turkey. Um, but the idea being that it's just, uh, it's just way, way out there, okay? So a lot of the counts, that we had against the world's worst neighbor lay in intentional infliction of emotional distress, okay? What do you call it when a guy walks into your driveway naked and takes a poop there while he knows you're watching through the window? There's not a tort of unlawful defecation, right? It's IIED. Who wants to see that? Nobody, right? Maybe a few people. We're not going to go there. Um, Nobody, nobody wants to see that, essentially. You know, what do you call it when the guy walks around w with no pants on in the winter, you know, and showing off his genitals? No, no, you know, that's IIED. That's outrageous. That's not the kind of thing that's supposed to happen in a neighborhood, all right? So strict liability. So we've talked about negligence. We talked about intentional Recklessness is kind of in the middle. Now you got strict liability, and this really has to do um, with the whole duty breach kind of thing and the foreseeability kind of thing. So I, 
I hesitate to call it its own category. This is really sort of a modifier, okay? And over time, this strict liability stuff has arisen out of cases, and then in, in uh, certain situations, legislatures have written laws designating certain things to be strict liability towards. But it really comes out of extreme examples. And the idea is that there are some activities that are just so dangerous that even if you take all the care you possibly can, that if something goes wrong and you harm somebody, you still have to pay them for the harm you did. Okay? So there's, there are these certain things that are strict liability. If you're going to use explosives, either on the job or perhaps recreationally, you are going to be strictly liable for any harm that you do. Now what if you have a bunch of certifications related to explosives and you've taken graduate work and I have uncles and cousins who do uh, detonation, uh, detonation work and unexploded ordnance work and they take classes on this, they're experts on this, okay? Well, um, what if you have all that training and what if you do everything right and you follow all the safety protocols but you explode something and it breaks all the windows in everybody's house in the neighborhood one block over. Company's got to pay for that. Doesn't matter that they took all the precautions and tried to do everything right. It's just so ultra hazardous that they're going to be held liable. What if you like to keep a tiger as a pet? Right? There's actually more pet tigers than there are wild tigers now. It's kind of mind blowing. And suppose you have friends over, and the tiger bites somebody. Now what if you can show that you did all the training, you had a good cage, you know, your tiger had passed its feline good citizenship test, right? If there is such a thing, there's one for dogs. Doesn't matter, you still got to pay for the tiger bite, all right? Um, and so in those cases, you don't have to prove breach of duty or foreseeability of harm. You just have to show, yeah, this was there, explosives, tiger, etc. It harmed me. I know they didn't try to. I know they tried to take every precaution, but this still happened. Okay. Um, and the last thing I want to do today is res ipsa loquitur. This is Latin for the thing speaks for itself. Uh, res ipsa loquitur is a situation where you may not be able to uh, readily access the evidence that proves how something happened, but there's really no other way it could have happened other than the defendant screwed up. So this uh, x-ray here uh, with those, I don't know if they're forceps or hemostats or what that is, but it's something that shouldn't be left in the human body, okay? This person had surgery, they had a successful surgery, they got closed back up, they went home after a certain amount of time, something felt weird, they went back in for a checkup, they took an x-ray and they're like, you have a tool in your body, right? Now how did that get there? Did the person uh, open up their own skin and put it in? No, that's virtually impossible. The doctors must have left it in there when they were doing the surgery, right? Now, how do you prove that? Is there a video of the surgery that you can go to for evidence? No. But how else could it have been there? Right? Res ipsa loquitur. Thing speaks for itself. All right? So there's certain situations where it would be, you know, almost literally impossible to get that evidence, but the courts can allow the claim to go forward on this res ipsa loquitur theory. It's not very common, but it does happen. All right, this is a good time to break. We'll come back Thursday and we'll do common business torts.